So, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, another RNL talk. Uh, this time with uh, Jamie Joyce from the Society Library. And we're talking deliberation, decision making, libraries of knowledge, so many things. And um, I wanted to uh, take the opportunity to have Jamie explain their research process and how they do things at Society Library to come up with the outputs that they did. Uh, namely the paper and the map for the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant uh, debate, let's call it, in California. And um, Jamie, uh, take it away. Okay, sounds good. Hello, everyone. Um, just a quick show of hands, uh, if you could. Who has seen our outputs? Who has seen us give a presentation before and see the kinds of things that we create? One. Okay, so... A lot of people here haven't seen that. Okay, great. So I'm going to start by showing some of these outputs so you know what I'm talking about. But I'll talk a little bit about the organization first. So I'm the executive director of a nonprofit called the Society Library. Our big, broad mission is to improve humanity's relationship to information. And that means building tools and products and services and providing knowledge work so that people are able to view complex issues through more comprehensive lenses. And so some of the things we do include actually, Andrea, you had an interest in decision-making models. We create decision-making models, political ones at the city council level. We also have a toolkit. Um, there's many ways in which you can make a decision, but um, we structured ours specifically for making a ballot decision. We also, we've used our methodology to write legislation. We have done educational curricula at 32 different universities, mainly in the United States. But one of the most complex things that we do is build something that we call debate maps, which also serve as libraries. Essentially, a debate map is the ontological structure of the data in a library. So instead of the Dewey Decimal System and kind of organizing books by like genre and author, the Society Library decided as we are um, collecting and organizing knowledge, we're going to go ahead and front load that into a debate map. So I'll show you a little bit about what that looks like. And then for all the researchers out there, I'll tell you how we do it. Um, even though I hope it will change very soon with increased implementation of AI. So I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully this works. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Lovely. Um, so in general, Society Library, uh, one of the big things that we do, I'll just scroll down, um, is like, again, create all these artifacts. Currently we're mapping debates. We want to move our political decision-making models into more of like a digital Congress, a public, produ a public policy producing engine, and then inevitably, inevitably just be this centralized knowledge base. So the society library is really like where we're headed, um, even though it seems as though like we're creating these collections now, it's really just about creating debate maps ma now. And I'm going to skip, we've done a number of different subjects, climate change, COVID-19 election integrity. So many of these subjects are so comprehensive and broad um, it takes immense amount of resources to complete. You'll notice these ones are broken up by subtopics, which are really big genres of a concept. When Diablo Canyon, which is the first one we published, is 4,000 points. So that essentially means claims, premises, arguments, uh, et cetera. And um, when we create debate maps, what we're essentially doing is extracting arguments, claims, and evidence from over 12 types of media to build databases that articulate the reasoning from all points of view. So let me show you what the database itself looks like, and then I'll show you the front end. Here is our database. Uh, some of you who saw a talk that I gave recently, I suspect some of you, I, I think I know the, the talk you may have seen. Um, I've, I've shown this database before. We were given a grant to uh, map out the debate about what should happen to the last remaining nuclear power plant in the state of California. This power plant has been uh, the subject of protest for decades. People have been arguing about its economic feasibility, its safety, um, environmental issues, energy related issues, ethical issues, political issues for literally decades. And so um, what we did is essentially build this map. And it's funny that I'm, I'm starting from 
uh, the question itself, I, I'll, I'll explain to you how we actually find the initial question. But if we're asking ourselves a question of what should happen to the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant, instead of it being a keep it open, shut it down, which a lot of people may perceive as the two options, we found there's about nine different positions that people actually take. And how we come to these nine positions is by mass collecting data, deconstructing it down to the claim level, clustering it into categories, and essentially that aggregates up to a hierarchy. Um, and I'll explain that process. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm going in the order correctly, but hopefully it'll all click together in the end. So if we start with just position one, we have a number of different, um, there's so many types of arguments that are economic and environmental and related to safety and well-being. So the position is this high level kind of vague orientation towards the question. Position one is that the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plants license should expire and it should be decommissioned as scheduled. A differentiation from that is that it should be closed immediately and not as scheduled. Uh, it should be left open for five, 10, 20 years, only if regulations change. It should be turned into uh, a hydrogen plant or desalination. So there's all these different differentiations, which is essentially orientation, but with um, uh, different caveats or conditions. But if we go back to position one and we see all these different categories of arguments, the reason why we break up things into categories is because there's just so many arguments that people make. So right here is economic, and these are all the economic highest level arguments. Um, and then we have the same for environmental. So uh, let me zoom in and give you an example. So uh, uh, when we talk about high level arguments and claims, that means they're very vague. So here under the environmental section of arguments that support it should be closed down as scheduled, we have Diablo Canyon has a negative impact on marine life and the ocean ecosystem due to its cooling system. Now, if we think about the structure of that claim, those concepts are very broad and vague. And so at the Society Library, we then further deconstruct uh, that argumentation to be more specific. So for example, Diablo Canyon's once through cooling system causes water temperature to increase, which negatively impacts the ecosystem. A slight differentiation in terms of, of being more specific, but also needs to be broken down increasingly. So like, okay, according to what evidence, we're still processing data, um, according to what evidence, by how many degrees, what kind of impacts are we talking about, et cetera. So um, this is, you know, this is just economic work. This is environmental. Um, this is safety unpacking here. This is energy related unpacking here, education and political. And these debate maps can go down extremely far. Like I just wanna uh, skip over to one that's slightly unpacked. And you can kind of start seeing like the types of data that we've got. We've got quotes and references and graphs. Um, things break down, you know, pretty extensively in some cases. There's an economic argument that I like to use because it's super easy uh, to show the level of depth that we're talking about. Oh, here it is based on market forces. And the thing that we also do is break down arguments into each one of their respective premises. So if I just pack up this really quickly. Um, here we have one argument essentially stating that, you know, all things considered, closing down the plant isn't going to have the kind of economic uh, impact that we're thinking. Um, oh, no, this one is about uh, reducing uh, demand from customers. And this is all the different dimensions of making that ec economic argument of how and why demand uh, for Diablo Canyon energy is going to lessen and the impact of that. And you can just literally continue breaking down this argument down and down and down and down. And so um, we call this debate mapping. It's essentially a combination of argument mapping, um, which is more rigorous in terms of its structure, but also including that in higher level deliberation, like the vague positions and things like that. So who wants to look at a database like this? Uh, I'm not sure, I certainly do, but we were told you can't just publish something like this. No one wants to look at this. So what we did was come up with something we call society library papers. And essentially what this is, is this is a briefing document that contains all of the information of the database itself. And what you can do is like, we can click on the word economic and that's gonna summarize all of the high level arguments. So all of those nodes that we unpack, that huge list of nodes, that's all here in narrative format. And you can click on one, we've got notes, right? So like, this is something really important. Um, you know, we have this sentence, 
there are market forces, financial incentives, policy decisions, which have essentially made Diablo Canyon redundant, uncompetitive, undesirable. We have a note here, this could now be outdated because con conditions have changed since the claim was made. And you know, we can unpack and explore that further. And we can see like, oh, there's you know, draft legislation, PG&E may be given $1.4 billion. So it's gonna be kind of moot that the, the um, market dynamics aren't favorable to this nuclear power plant because um, the federal government of the United States has an interest in providing stimulus to nuclear power plants um, with you know, tons of funding if they are operating in un un unfavorable market conditions. So, I mean, these, um, depending on the argument you click, you can just unpack further and further and further. We also have the ability where you can, um, in the instance that we have claims that have various phrases, one of the things that we really wanna do is be um, flexible in the expression of content. So if we go quickly back to um, the map itself, there's a whole bunch of information that we can pack into one node. So here we have a tag, right? This is contested. So that means that we're trying to signal to our readers when they're looking at the map, much like seeing this note that something could be outdated, that this is a contested claim. There's con argumentation here, which means we don't want people to stop where they're unpacking, but there's a lot more information packed into this claim. Here we've got definitions that are a part of it, the definition of the NRC. We've got media, which is this graph. We've got references um, that need to be, you know, that essentially link back. And then we've got also quotes. Um, so this is where this content right here is where this claim came from. And it could be either the exact language from which we derive the claim or it's just the clue. It's how we surface that this claim was being made. Um, so anyway, uh, one of the things that we also include is various versions of claims. Now that's unfortunately very time consuming. Human curators have to do this in the future. AI will do it. Yay. Um, but what we have is essentially you can opt into different versions of the same claim. So if you go to the right, it's supposed to be a technical. If we have it available, this one, we do have a simple version for, which is according to PG&E, there are three main reasons why there will be less need for electricity from Diablo Canyon, as opposed to this claim, according to PG&E in 2016, three key trends have significantly reduced PG&E's electricity sales in recent years and will likely have an even greater impact on the future. The downward pressure on sales is reducing the need for electricity from Diablo Canyon. So just different versions of the same sentence you lose a little bit when you simplify things, you add a little bit when you, you know, are using jargon and things like that, but it's mostly for accessibility. And this goes back to the mission of the Society Library being a nonprofit, where we're trying to improve humanity's relationship to information. So for this product, like it's really important that we're inclusive and we're as accessible as we can. Of course, all of that is very expensive. We hope to automate a lot of it in the future. Um, so how do we create, you know, this unpackable piece of paper. Oh, and, and another feature is that you can essentially explore every single claim. There's like a little mini Wikipedia page on every claim. So here's the claim. Here's a description of the claim, just to give you more context, the quote from which the claim was derived, it being more simply put. Oh, we do have a more technically put. Um, nice. Um, as said on the internet. So this is like uh, a quote just from like a tweet or something like that. Here are the references. Here's relationship to other claims. So, um, you know, the Sci Library is pretty small and scrappy. This is like our first like push out of this kind of front end. But I'm going to pause and see if I've made sense at all or if anyone has any questions before I talk about how do we produce like these ridiculous data sets of structured knowledge like this. So let me pause and see if anyone has questions. Yes, Andrea. Um, so often points will support one argument and um, undermine a different one. Yep. How does that handle in the data structure? Um, good question. So I believe we've recently just resolved the infinite recursion problem. What we did before is essentially there's various ways in which we can um, clone nodes. So this looks like a tree structure. It's actually a graph database. Um, and we have different things that we can do. So we can clone nodes and we can copy nodes and like cut and paste nodes. So the cloning feature is essentially like reproducing the node while being able to edit it. But at the same time, we have a differentiation of our cloning capability where essentially um, we're creating a differentiated clone that if you edit it, it's not gonna edit all the copies from which it was copied from. Our copy feature does that where you can essentially create copies and they're all the same throughout. So in order to overcome the infinite recursion, um, we use clone, which clones the top node, makes it so it's not connected to all the other copies, but all of the children nodes are connected to all of the other copies. So if that's updated and changed, it's just linked. But that means that um, the, the other node that we copy is not going to recognize that this clone is a copy. So it's not just going to like, you know, infinitely unpack forever. 
Um, it's hard to explain, but essentially we have accommodated for that in the data structure. It's just like how we go about connecting the nodes. It's like a two-step process and we have a special way of making a copy of it. Um, yeah, so it just doesn't go infinitely back and forth. Any other questions before I move on? Yes, Paolo. Yeah, just um, maybe one about zooming out a little bit. Uh, why are why is this needed, right? Uh, yeah. A little bit, a little, a little bit of context on all of this, and and uh, why the society library is investing so much effort in doing this. Super great question. So. Um, I gave a talk about this yesterday is that I don't uh, think that unless you're a knowledge worker, you really see how bad the epistemic environment really is. I think there may have been an opportunity in the past, whether it was just a dream that people had about the nature of the web, or it has it lies only in the future, but a linked knowledge web um, is something that I think people could really benefit from chain of providence, evidence you know, linked to claims, these sorts of things could have been like the base upon which we built the web, but we don't. Our, our web is broken. Um, there's so much redundancy of knowledge. Um, there's so much like broken chains of providence. I gave a talk yesterday, or actually my colleague gave a talk um, alongside me and she talked about this one example from Diablo Canyon where there's this claim that's been made so often about 1.5 billion fish being sucked up into its OTC system, getting back to that marine life claim that I showed earlier, 1.5 billion fish sucked up into the OTC system. Um, and we have found it in newspaper articles, on social media, activist websites, in policy, never linked to any evidence. We saw it so often, but never linked to any actual evidence. I began to think personally, it was like a weird myth. Like, is this just like a cultural myth that's persisted for like a decade? And then we finally, after going through like 15 agencies worth of government documents, found the like 478 page study where it explained like, this is how we came up to the number of like 1.48 billion fish being entrained in the OTC system, yada, yada, yada. Um, and so like, unless someone's willing to do an immense amount of work, they may be interacting with a very superficial layer of information. And just because of where it comes from, because it's so, you know, it's said with such conviction from an activist or it's in a policy document or a newspaper's reporting it, we assume it must be veritable. In this case, it was. But the fact that like we do not have this linked knowledge um, just means that there's so much more surface area for us to be fooled and propagandized. Um, or misled, you know, whether it's intentional or not intentional. So the society library dreams of there being some kind of commonly held societal infrastructure of linked knowledge so that people can explore all different points of view and they can actually see what evidence connects to what arguments, what kind of arguments exist so that we can make more rational and informed decisions about these sorts of things. Because if we're just, if it, I think we are um, deceived by how readily available information is. When I search something on Google, something comes up. And so I think a lot of people have the impression that like, this works great. Like, wow, we have, like my tools work. I get the information I'm looking for without realizing that there's many layers of depth that are often missing because the web is broken and knowledge is not linked. So the society library is doing this manually, mostly just to prove like it can be done because there's been like 30 years of people trying to do this and failing. And I can actually talk about, since this whole you know, gathering of individuals is about talking about research methods, one of the things the Society Library did before we developed our research methods is we looked at 168 different systems. And we saw, okay, a lot of them are making the same assumptions about human behavior, about tool usage and these sorts of things. And maybe that's some of the reason why they failed, never like really took off, like you know, only stays in academia. So we specifically curated our strategy to avoid what we saw as some of the perceived pit pitfalls of so many other projects that wanted to create linked knowledge libraries um, at the argument and claim level. Because there's plenty of linked knowledge libraries. Libraries themselves are linked knowledge. Um, but at the argument and claim level. So that's why I think this is important because I think it is the inevitable evolution of where information in a digital age uh, should go in terms of its own development and uh, someone should be doing it. So we are. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions before I move on? I'm sorry, yes, I have a question. Uh, is this uh, accessible to all or you have to, uh, is this, yeah, it's, it's a service, right? That everybody can just be part by it or I'm not sure how that works. 
Um, yeah, so the, oops, I'm still showing my screen. I just pulled tabs out. Um, yes, uh, the Society Library is a 501c3 nonprofit organization and we give away this data for free. We're, we're trying to get people to imagine what a new digital public library could be. So instead of going to a physical location and renting a book or going and downloading a book from a digital bo bookshelf from a digital library, the Society Library is about creating a library of society's ideas. And so we've decided to like kind of target the niche that Wikipedia doesn't do well. Wikipedia is a fantastic resource, but when it comes to politicized issues, like the Wikipedia like has their standards about what they will include in terms of information and they make decisions about what to prioritize. And the society library is like, well, you know, we're not trying to confine something to a digital encyclopedia page like Wikipedia is. We want to create libraries. So we have this Diablo Canyon library where you can see all the different books from all the different like um, authors from all the different genres. What that really means is that you're seeing all of the clean, consolidated, steel manned, fact checked um, arguments, claims, and evidence from all points of view and across economic safety, blah, 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 dimensions that we find people really care about and are talking about. And we're, our goal is just, we'll save you 10,000 hours of research. If you want to learn about this oh subject. Oh my God, that's amazing. That's, that's, I, I think there's something that have been, I, this is just, oh my God, this is amazing. I even start to think like how this is going to be also proof of um, actually correlation between stuff and um, yeah, they, oh wow, I have to get into this one. I, I love it. <laughs> yeah. So Jamie, you. Jamie, I have a yeah. question for you. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can see the value of it. It's amazing. It really is phenomenal. And um, I'm curious about how, what the strategy is for making this accessible to a larger population of people and um and then how you're staying funded i mean who yeah. this this is a this is a labor intense job right without yes. question now ai will shorten that labor but it still requires you know the human element to go into the discipline of inquiry to as deep as you're going so um how is it funded and then how do you expand it out to a large population like would a uh, a new search engine like tempest be a good partner for this. Okay, so great series of questions. I'll I'll mention the funding thing. So uh, the Society Library is deceptively a tiny nonprofit. A lot of people think we're very large, and we are not. This entire Diablo Canyon project, including the creation of the papers front end, um, was done with a grant of seventy eight thousand um, dollars. So we're extraordinarily cash efficient, um, and we hire like librarian analysts. So who are like incredibly talented, incredibly well educated, but they don't get like data scientist uh, salaries, even though they're totally underrated data scientists. I'd obviously love to give them as much as a data scientist, but we're just like a group of like super passionate, scrappy analysts and researchers. And we get a lot of volunteer contribution too, in terms of um, tech time and developer time. So often a lot of our funding comes in through um, private donors. So just like one like family fund or one DAF or a donor here and there dropping 10,000 here or there, or even a couple hundred bucks. Um, we just kind of like pulled that together. And that's why I, I showed when I was showing the presentation that there was many subjects that we tackled, but there's too expensive for us to have finished. Like we started COVID-19, found I think 576 different dimensions of the debate, 274 for climate change. So we've started like the scaffolding of these, but like to actually execute is very expensive. And we're like a tiny nonprofit. We just broke the $100,000 a year annual budget this year, which is pretty nuts. Um, so people, uh, we, we did recently just finally get institutional funding, the independent or um, the international fact checking network just gave us a grant to teach our methods to fact checkers. So we're actually building an educational curricula for the world's fact checkers to kind of teach them about like logical argumentation and steel manning and like not so much just like labeling something as true or not true based on the presence of evidence or not, but to be a little bit more nuanced about these things. So we're starting to get prestige and recognition. I think that'll only continue. Um, and then the second part of your question was what? <laughs> um, well, you I was, I, you know, I, the, the, there was three parts, I guess. The one okay. part was that how do we get it up to a larger population yes. of people to look at it? And then the, the last part is who is a good partner that actually can accelerate it? Like who can yeah. you, you know, jump in the, in the, in the apple cart with, so to speak. 
thank you for reminding me. This is why collective intelligence is so important. Um, okay, so uh, the strategy currently for the Society Library is not to invest in building our own audience. Would it be lovely if we just magically got an audience by going viral or something like that? Of course, but we're a very complex thing for people to understand because we're metaphorically taking things like libraries and debates and transforming them with technology. And that can be difficult for people to wrap their head around. And like, that's like the closest language to describing what we do besides jargon. And so it's, I can't imagine we're gonna have an audience for some time. So our strategy is work with the people who already have audiences and improve their knowledge output and then you improve the epistemic commons. So for example, there's a number of debate organizations who they have consistent sustainable funding because they're able to prove that the way in which they conduct debates for the public depolarizes attitudes, which is really big right now. So we've approached a number of those organizations and said, hey, awesome that you're bringing mediation techniques to debate or that you give it an air of like dignity so that people feel called to be on their best behavior and are following rules and that changes people's minds and blah, blah, blah. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the arguments that are being exchanged in the format that you're carefully curating are less BS. So let us do the work of mapping out deliberations. And we, we've done this with organizations. We've gone to debate organizations and said, we took a fact that you had in your brief as a summary of what was discussed. Here's a, like a mini debate map about that specific claim being made. And we can just like really upgrade your output in terms of what you push out to people or um, you know, in real time, you can be checking the database to see, okay, someone made a claim. What are all the different counterclaims to that? And just being more comprehensive in how those things are conducted. You mentioned a search engine. We are super interested in partnering with search engines because that's another like outlet through which audiences and users already exist where we could just funnel data through. So there's the debate mapping organizations. There's also journalists. We've been reaching out to journalists and saying, hey, journalist, we saw you made this claim. You linked to no evidence. Here's a page of evidence and pro-con argumentation about that, why don't you just link to this? We're thinking that like maybe what we would have to do is give the data away. They would generate um, a page on their own website so they can get the ad revenue. And it's like, whatever, we're a nonprofit. We want to improve the epistemic space. We can give them the content. They put it in a format that's familiar. They link it to themselves. Everyone's better off, um, but also search engines. So Google, for example, pulls in data from Wikipedia Enterprise. So Wikipedia sells their data as enterprise access to the likes of Google and other companies. When you Google something, if Wikipedia has data on that, oftentimes Google will surface that at the top of its search result. Sometimes that's actually a Google page. I'm writing an article right now about how you can mess with that. Um, I was like just changing Wikipedia and then like the next day the search engine would be like the opposite, like an untrue thing. But Google auto-generated like its own page, like googleartsandculture.com Da, 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 and just like what the, the thing that I said. So it's it's like you can mess with these kinds of things. And so I, I'm after I make an uh, article about that, it's actually how we got the fact checking grant um, is we mess with fact checkers and then show them we can prove it. So unfortunately, I can't stay on much longer, but I just put my contact information in the chat. Please reach out to me. I want to make an introduction to a search engine that I think you need to get on board with. We would love that, Larry. Thank so, you so much. All right. Thank you. Thanks for what you're doing. It's very cool. Very cool work. Thank you. Okay. Um, great. So I'm going to save that. And then uh, we can go on to talking about methods. If you all are interested, how do we create these debate maps? Um, you know, we've seen there's there's hundreds of different debate mapping platforms out there. They vary in their level of robustness. There's some that are really popular, like Kialo but the logical structure of Kialo's interface is like not very sophisticated in terms of like the pro-con relationships. They just have pros and cons next to it, like underneath the parent. So how, do, how did we like find this system that can accommodate enough complexity or at least so we think without being too academic and overwhelming and how do we get people to actually produce this? So uh, let me pull up my screen again and we'll dive into that. <laughs> A quick question before uh, you continue, if you could, please. Of um, course. How do you verify the accuracy of the information that it enters in the database? Well, there's various different ways in which we assess accuracy. So it's like, is it accuracy of the meaning of the thing itself? Or is it accuracy of our representation of it? Is it accuracy of how we've input it? So like, there's a number of different things that we have to look at. One thing in terms of like, uh, in the discussion of meaning, is that the society library is never gonna tell anyone what's true or not true. 
We are not fact checkers. We're not gonna say this is true and this is false. All we do is contextualize by argumentation. So if we input something in the database, that's not frivolous, right? Like if we can actually make a standard form claim out of it and it's not like just insane speak that we can't make sense of and therefore omit because we like, I don't know what this, we literally don't know what it means. If it's not frivolous and we input it, especially if it's like popular and like relevant, salient, all these things. Um, uh, we would do the work of doing what we call devil's advocacy. So we do the work of, oh, wait, let's steal man it. Let's see like what evidence supports this, what arguments support this. Let's see if it's found anywhere substantial like we did with the 1.5 billion fish. We spent way too much time eventually finding evidence for this 1.5 billion fish. And it was like consequential, but we also do the opposite. Um, and this will get into like some of the methods. We, we've got 22 different methods across like whether it's a cultural method or it's like a long-term method, knowledge policies, like actual research techniques, 22 different methods for overcoming our own biases. So one of those is devil's advocacy. And when we do have devil's advocacy, it's counter argumentation. And so that's really what we do. We're not gonna tell anyone something's accurate or not, but we're gonna reveal to people by doing the work of steel manning and uh, doing devil's advocacy, arguing for and against to show via context. And that's why we have those notes, something like contested. It's like, we want you to see this is contested. So don't stop in the map here. Don't stop in the papers here. You need to unpack further because there's counter argumentation to this. We don't want you to miss it. And then it's up to people. And like, really, I mean, when someone decides in their own mind that something is true, um, it's a heuristic of their own. Some people are gonna see graphs or evidence, or they're gonna look into like how substantial a study was or that it was, you know, uh, a meta-analysis was performed or it's something that's just generally accepted in the field and say, I put a lot of value in that. I'm gonna consider this to be accurate. Um, and then some people are like, oh, there's a text, there's a, a, pe like a piece of content from the Bible that sounds like this. That's true to me because the word of God is truth, right? So we'll never tell anyone what's true, not true. We just focus on making sure that we're comprehensive, we're inclusive, and that we just have all the right signals, the visual signals. And again, we're a tiny nonprofit, so we only have so big of a design budget. We're like doing the best we can, um, hopefully to do better in the future. Um, the design elements to signal to people um, to have that comprehensive view of like a section of a relationship between nodes in order to get a more clear picture of its accuracy or inaccuracy. Basically evidence, right? Like. Uh, evidence, graph, yeah, evidence connected and then you kind of decide whether you want to agree with it or not right yep it's up to the individual at the end of the day and like a lot of people don't like that but i think it's just like practically like it's like it's just like the practical way in which we all experience the idea of truth oh i love it because we don't think this is the same and i exactly. and now like we have all these claims everywhere this and that but who, who, who actually, can, like, who made that decision? That's, that's another thing. Right, yeah. So the Society Library's decision is that we're not going to make the decision for you. It's up to you, but we're just saving you 10,000 hours of finding all this stuff. I love it. This is genius. Genius, Aww. genius. I love that's very it. Sweet. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, any other questions before I move on to, like, the process? Okay, let's talk about tools and stuff. Yay. <laughs> So um, can you see my screen? I can't hear anybody. Or can someone shout out? Can you see? Yes, yes. Lovely, thank you. OK, so there, this is the general overview of our process, which is essentially that we start with some archival me methods. We transcribe that into like machine readable text. We begin extracting and categorizing claims and arguments. We start inputting in the database, and then we focus on visualizing and tagging and all that stuff. So. When we archive something, there's a number of different tools. The first step that we do is something we call a, a topic flyover. So that means we're gonna start zeroing in on who are the most popular thought leaders in this space, what's the most viral content, and just start essentially scraping together um, what are the high level categories of this. So a topic catalog, I think, um, I think I may actually have to present this. One moment. Um, Let's see, can you still see my screen? Confirm. Yes, great. Yay, okay, great. So if I click on topic catalog, um, these are like subtopics that we started picking up on immediately. So like, you know, what is SARS-CoV-2, a naturally occurring zoonotic coronavirus, a man-made or known virus, a new coronavirus developed as a bioweapon, yada, 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 yada. So we go on and on. So we just essentially take a look at 
um, the media and like popular content for COVID, it was such a new thing. So it was just, um, you know, you can kind of grab it from anywhere. And this is what we call a topic flyover. So essentially it gives us the uh, place to start. And then once we have all of these different topics, we create something that we call an archive catalog. Let me click on that. And you're seeing my screen change, is that right? Yep, we're following. Yes. Okay, great, great, great. Yeah, um, and let me see if I can get rid of, okay. So then we start looking at, um, this is not a particularly great example. We start selectively targeting different article, like different type media types where this claim could live. So we're talking about justifying the use of the vaccine. And this is very old data. Again, I think we had like a max $10,000 to work on COVID, but we have news and websites, scholarly articles, books and textbooks. We start identifying experts. We start identifying videos. And so basically what we're doing is we do this flyover, we get the high level topics. Then for every single topic, we create an archive catalog where we find different forms of media that have this sentiment in it. And then we essentially do that unpacking process down and down and down and down. Because as we completely deconstruct, as you'll see in a moment, as we deconstruct a media artifact that contains one topic, it's going to reveal to us 20 other topics that are referenced in that media artifact. And then we start over, we, oh, we zero in on that new subtopic, we find a bunch of different targeted media artifacts that contain that subtopic, and then unpack all of those and find even more um, subtopics. So it's just like this constant, like hierarchical breaking down and discovery process. And there's a variety of different things we do to make sure that we're comprehensive. Cause like I said, the society library really cares about being really inclusive, really rigorous, really comprehensive in this exploration. So when we're creating the skeleton framework of the topic space, um, you know, that's kind of like the method of how we begin that, but there's a number of things that we use to make sure that we're doing it as, um, to, to combat our own biases. So one thing is that we have custom search engines. Um, we've created a number of different curated search engines that target certain like areas of the web. So for example, we've got these databases of um, news, news article like outlets um, that we've broken down across a political spectrum. It does not matter if we if we are accurate and how we've labeled these news outlets, the important thing is that we're checking all of them just to see like what nuances and variations on the expression of this sentiment are being expressed across different across the political spectrum. We can also create curated feeds from different websites, like government websites and things like that. We'll do recorded interviews. Every, I just wanna emphasize this, every single time we've ever worked on a subject, no matter how exhaustively, how much data we've gathered about a debate, we always get new novel stuff when we interview people. So talking to people is very important because a lot of, there is a digital divide. A lot of people don't put things into, you know, digital print, so to speak. So it's very important to talk to people, talk to stakeholders, send out surveys, solicit more information. We also have access to a number of databases. So we can search television, we can search the world's news through things like GDELT. Um, depending upon the subject, there can be all sorts of like open and available data sets so we we gather and select those and then what's most important is like tools and training so you know we we have our analysts if they're new go through this rigorous process of deconstructing content on the claim level learning what we mean by a claim you know teaching them to invert it to its opposite on and on and on so it's a combination of like tools and methods and training that is step one of our process which is just archiving um great and then once we have all that data, we've got some tools to transcribe it and turn it into machine readable text. Yay, this is gonna be so helpful when AI can substitute a lot of uh, this work, which I'm very excited for one day. Um, and then something that we do is uh, extract and categorize. So again, this relies on a lot of training. The society library has standardized what it means by a claim, um, what it means by an argument, et cetera. We do have argument mining tools. So AI powered argument mining tools, essentially that means argument detection within natural language. So we'll take the media artifacts that we gather and we'll port it through the argument mining AI that will deliver arguments to us. But something that we also do, and I think I pulled up an example, my favorite example, uh, Sean Hannity. Um, this is an example of society library media deconstruction. So uh, we were actually asked specifically to work on this um, by another nonprofit. This is 17, a 17 minute clip by Sean Hannity. And they said, this guy said so much in a 17 minute segment. And like, I have no idea how to deal with it being true or not. And I think there's like 438, like implied claims, 138 actual claims, something to that effect um, that he made. And it's just like to think about 
the human brain, like processing all of that and like actually having the critical thought process of being like, is that true? Like, like having that moment of skepticism is just like, it's, it, I think it's impossible to think the human mind could like really do that rigorously. So I'll, I think we're all absorbing a lot of content, but anyway, so this is an example of taking a video, breaking it down into text. Here we've got the people who are speaking, the timestamp, the transcription itself. We have notes on imagery, notes on the video, notes on the music, like there's clapping here, you know, that's a gesture of approval um, that could have a subtle impact on how people are perceiving things. And then what our analysts do is they literally deconstruct it line by line. So they will take lines in the transcript of things that are actually being said, and then they will standardize that um, to a more standard claim format. So here's like one sentence, line 17, and you can see we got a number of different claims from line 17. Um, so this is a very compound statement. You get free higher education, you get free health care, free vacation, free green housing, free healthy food, universal basic income. And so we standardize that to, because we know from an earlier line, he's referencing the Green New Deal, we standardize it into those claims. Um, and then you have all of these different claims. And I mean, we do do like, you know, screenshot um, deconstruction, because again, like the imagery does matter and YouTube comments as well. And this is all very lovely machine learning training data. Um, but anyway, the purpose of deconstructing things down to the claim level like that is that you can begin to then cluster and categorize it. So great, we've got all these Green New Deal claims. And then because we've got, you know, 100 Green New Deal claims, we can see that they start breaking up and disambiguating into healthcare, into environmental stuff, into social justice. So we can begin clustering and then after a cluster, begin internally seeing the disambiguation of topics from within a cluster. And so we do that. And then here's an example. I kind of showed you an example already. But in this one statement, um, which is a natural language snippet, uh, we can have this many derived claims and this many implied claims. So we are really rigorous about like pulling out as much meaning as possible from natural language um, for the purpose of like fact checking every tiny little discrete implied claim within them. And implied claims just kind of means like it's not something that can be derived from the natural language from like with certainty that that's what it implies to mean. But an implied claim means um, using the existing language, this is something that may be interpreted as implied in this statement. So essentially, sometimes these are like the unstated premises of an argument, like um, in, in order to, uh, yeah, unstated premises of an argument, essentially that are missing, that if we're there could create a valid or more sound argument. Now, one of the reasons why I got tripped up at the beginning of this talk about where to start is that the society library kind of like works backwards and then turns immediately around. So as you saw in the database right here, um, we start with a question right here, <laughs> and then we have positions, then we have categories, and then we have high-level arguments, and then we break down those arguments into claims and evidence. So, uh, but how we get to that hierarchy is actually the opposite. So we start with collecting the references and evidence, right, by like doing that topic flyover, creating those little catalog sheets for every topic, finding little media artifacts that contain that topic, and then we extract the arguments and claims like you saw. We do the clustering into categories and subcategories, and then what that does is that it starts to indicate to us what positions exist. Why are people making these arguments? Like, why are people bothering? It's usually because they're taking a stance. Now, what's important to understand about the society library is that we deal with like complex like social and political issues. So like they are debatable things. Not every, I mean, I would argue that technically all claims are debatable, <laughs> um, but uh, we, we take highly contentious, we, we go after like the, the impactful, persistent, polarizing issues. So that means people are taking positions. And it's through this process of um, deconstructing down the claim level and clustering up, do we aggregate positions that people are taking on something? And then once we have positions, we also have a cluster of positions which actually contain, as you can like literally see here, like these positions contain all of this, um, then we actually find out what the question is. So why, like, once you have a series of positions, you can see what they're taking a position on, which is the question. And what's really important about this and something that I think that we've also resolved is that if you arbitrarily ask a question, that can lead to really messy um, argument mapping because you may not have strict bounds on the scope of relevance of the argumentation. Let me give an example of that. So um, in our climate change data, we have only six questions. We have 396,000 premises in the database. It's in a like CSV file and we had to like export it when we were building our new thing. But anyway, there's a lot of claims. There's like 278 subtopics that contain all those claims. But in all of those subtopics, 
all of them have positions which correspond to answering one of six questions. Now, uh, extreme weather events are a topic within climate change. They're, they're a category of content that could be expressed. There's plenty of arguments about extreme weather events. So if you just started mapping um, about extreme weather events without a clear question that defines the scope, you're going to be mapping a whole lot of things. And it's hard to like explain to people who haven't like done this work themselves. Maybe some of you have, but essentially like you lead into like that recursive issue where something is kind of related to something else. And, you know, you, so you link it together, but you don't know the conclusion that you're arguing toward because you don't have a question that's demanding an answer. And so the question about like, let's go back to um, extreme weather events, we have the topic of extreme weather events that's relevant to two questions. One question is, is climate change happening? The other question is, what is the impact of climate change? And so when we are arguing about um, that there is an increased frequency and intensity of extreme weather events, that goes under evidence that climate change is happening. But when we talk about the devastation and destruction to agriculture and human life and well-being from extreme weather events, that goes into under the question of what is the impact of climate change? And they don't, they don't connect in society library ont ontology. They are related, but they do not connect because the questions themselves um, define what is relevant to talk about. And for the society library, we're interested in answering questions, not again, providing truth, but just mapping out all the different points of view and answering what we, what we call the fundamental questions that society has in a specific domain. And we're creating this ontological structure. So we actually argue towards an answer and we just don't argue infinitely forever, which is something that I think if AI doesn't like catch up on um, in terms of finding fundamental questions or orientations or understanding context and being able to contact, like compute context very deeply, then you're just gonna be able to argue with an AI forever and ever and ever and ever. And you may not get like the complete like concrete answer that you're looking for if it doesn't understand deliberation and context as a part of its question answering process. So that's how we get to our hierarchical structure, which is like very nerdy, but also very important to how the society library relates to our work. And then, like I said, we, we map it. Uh, you've seen the debate mapping software. There's all these different nodes, question nodes, category nodes, argument nodes, um, where we can break it up into logical proofs with premises and conclusions, claim nodes, definitions, various phrasing. And then all of the relationships between nodes is like pro-con truth um, and pro-con relevance. Um, we have node attachments, video, image, media, equations, references, quotes, and there are impact and truth scores, but we don't turn those on. Like one day in the future, like we may want to like connect with models um, to start like calculating or indicating to people like some sort of confidence measure, but that's a whole can of worms that we're not interested in getting involved in right now. But we understand that some people may not read all of this content and they may want to opt into a system. So having the capability to like quantify certain dimensions of this is something that we just are, you know, keeping available for the meantime. And that was the idea of um, the person who created debate map, who's been a part of the society for a long time. Um, when I mentioned that we looked at 168 different systems, we actually found his and um, partnered with him to develop it for our purposes. And then, yeah, we, we can present it, we can give tours of it. You saw what ended up being our latest interface, which is society library papers. Um, but yeah, that is kind of like the high level walkthrough. Um, something that's really important to know is that with any research methods, uh, you are building something towards an end. So we had the output that we wanted in mind and we build the, the tools in the pipeline to end up at that output. So it's kind of bespoke. I don't know how useful it is to everybody else to like adopt some of our methodologies or tools because we're trying to get to a very specific endpoint. But that's generally how the society library does it. I'll, we have people working on models right now to automate different dimensions of the pipeline. Um, and I think in the near future, especially with the way these language models are, are you know, developing so quickly, I think we may be able to have like real time live comprehensive libraries and like humans will just be in the loop to do like integrity checks and do a stamp of like human looked at this node versus human has not yet looked at this node. Um, yeah, so does anyone have any questions now? I, I do, and I'll interrupt. Poor Apollo can't jump in fast enough. Um, how do you know you come up with a good question? It kind of reveals itself in the data. Um, and so we've had to revise questions many times. So yeah. it's like when we actually start mapping, it's like, is this clean? Like, are we actually headed towards a direction of conclusion? 
or are we suddenly taking a turn and kind of bleeding into another question or going into a different topic? So it's literally the cleanliness of the data clicking into place where it's like, okay, this is what we call the most fundamental question. And it's not like it's a good question. It's just, this is like the most base regressed back question that is so like specific in scope of relevance next to all the other questions that like it's going to make the data really clean to input. Um, so, so your whole data structure ends up like this is cohering around this rather than getting bleeding into other topics. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. We're trying to, it's, it's a great. big, it's a big complex way of answering a question, but instead of answering it with like a fact, it's answering it with, here's all the different points of view you could take on this and all the ar arguments, why any one of these answers could be the answer you're looking for. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And then Paolo, yes. I have a, a question. Uh, by the way, um, did, did the initial question of the, the, the Diablo Canyon map was updated recently? Not sure. It's, I believe it's what should happen. So it's a should question. Right. It's yeah, not I, like, I, I think I think I think I saw it some weeks ago, and there was not the phrasing. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> and I saw it, and I was like, hmm, "This is a bit maybe biased the way it was phrased before." Because I think it was phrased before, uh, "Should the nuclear power plant be discontinued as planned, or something like that?" Oh, that's a position. So a position is, I mean, I don't I don't think it's changed recently. So maybe you're I don't know. I I, I I I have no idea. I have no idea. Uh, but yeah. I had the the suspicion that the, it changed because now when I read it uh, in that phrasing, I was like, oh, there was not maybe the phrasing that I had, which is good, and it, it proves kind Better of the phrase, point that yeah. you were making, which was that you have to do the mapping to come up with the right question. That is right, exactly, that, and that that, that does right. change over time. We're like, oh, we're asking the wrong question. Actually, there's a more fundamental question, or there's two questions here that we piled into one. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to ask something about the um, what you call the impact and truth scores. And mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to ask if you're uh, having, if you have some weights in the positions or in the arguments of some sort. And uh, I wanted to note that in the current interface, because it shows the amounts of quotes that each argument has, it can imply that some arguments are more popular than others mm -hmm. and have more weight than others. And so as a user, you could say, oh, I'm only going to explore positions and arguments that have a lot of claims because I think these are the most relevant ones. So that's a kind of weighting that's uh, unconsciously happening there. Cool. And if you had any plans to deal with that or more specifically or not, basically. I'll start with your latter question then answer the question you, you said before. So um, one, first of all, thanks, great feedback, like super great feedback. Um, Again, I want to stress we're a tiny nonprofit. I would love to have a very large budget to have a design firm and do lots of user testing because like literally, like it, it's not just about the data itself that's going to improve people's relationship to information because we're visual creatures. We have all these heuristics and biases. So we do have to figure out all the different visual cues that'll make it so people are seeing the information a little bit more rationally. The meaning is coming through without any extra or without losing anything. So there's a lot of work left to do. Those like badges and quotes and then things like that is just like how far we've gotten now and it's the features that we find important which is essentially chain of providence the the quotes are chain of providence if the evidence is a you know study in a 478 page report i find it to be ridiculous as a linked knowledge standard for someone to make a claim and be like here's a 400 page like article like are you kidding me so the quote feature is about taking that paragraph context of where that came from and saying the claim came from this here and then you can go that next layer and go look at the original artifact if you want. Um, so thanks for that feedback. Um, we're always gonna be working on like iterating more and making it um, uh, less biased in terms of its visual representation. And um, on papers, we don't have that, right? On papers, you don't see how many quotes there are per node until you unpack it and see it. Mm -hmm. So that kind of removes that as a, as a front end. And then for the impacts and, and truth scores, which I mean, we need to change immediately. Um, again, those were like the idea of the person who created, the technologist who created date, Debate Map, who's a, a partner of ours. Um, the, we do not have any metrics. We do not have any weighting. There are um, different dimensions of how those scores would be implemented. Um, so like people can like vote on things that is in the infrastructure of the technology, but we have turned it off. In the society, we call it the society library standard. Um, the creator of debate map has maintained the use of that functionality. The society library has turned it off, even to see. We don't even want users to see it or think about it. 
but the capability within the technology is there if we want to iterate upon that and use it later. But that is a huge, I, I said can of worms because that is, could be implying so much subjective bias in the structure of that, that we would have to undertake immense amount of labor to figure out how to do that right. And we're not gonna, we're not there yet. So it's a technological capability. We have turned it off and we have no interest in using it anytime soon. Good, awesome. Do the researchers also see it or not? Hmm? Do the people that are doing the no curation- No one sees it. No, no the society it. library Good. standard thank is you. gone. Thank you, thank you, yep. thank you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Should remove it from the presentation because it's like it's misleading like it, yes it's a capability of the technology but we never use it and we explicitly remove like removed it from our own standards it, it's not just that it's, it's probably the biggest fear that people have about something like this yes. which is you will you will influence public opinion if you have an agenda and if you have a blah, blah 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 right so if you want to remain neutral you have to disable it basically. yep uh the creator of debate map his name is venrix and uh, when I mentioned, like, we looked at 168 different debate mapping systems to see what pitfalls they fell into, um, I found his work. And I was like, yours is my favorite and the best I've ever seen. And uh, he's like, well, I love the mission of the Society Library. I'll team up. And he's been, he's been adapting his technology for our use case for, like, four years now, um, which is very nice of him. So he's a part of the team, and but he, he keeps his features that he likes. And we're like, okay, just it's not a part of the Society Library standard. You keep that over there. You know, Society Library is like, we're going to turn some things off that you Good think boundary, good boundary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? I have more questions if nobody steps up. <laughs> um, uh, is, the, is the training that you uh, do open source? It will be. So um, we're going to be making, we're going to be taking a lot of our methods and bring it to the fact checkers and the fact checking thing is going to be open source. What I cool. do want to do is like mookify what we've done and make that open source because cool. like a lot of, especially we, we, we teach students this methodology and we teach analysts this methodology, but we keep an eye, like it's, it's very like much observed. So we see pe where people are struggling and we're like, okay, well, we'll give you another exercise. So like, because we're training people with the intent of them being like good independent sovereign workers for us um, and for the mission, like we're really invested. Like we've got the exercises, we've got like the, you know, the document, this is what the society library considers a claim and blah, blah, blah. We have all the documentation, but like we're really hands-on when it comes to the training and development of people who are gonna be touching the database. So I think it's gonna take a little bit of thought to think about how you can mookify that and be like, how would a, you know, what, what's the best system out there where if someone fails a test, it's gonna give them another exercise. And so people don't just like go through the thing and then think they, they, they've mastered the skill, but like make it so that they really master the skill because normally it's my COO and I that pay very close attention to that and make sure it happens. Um, or just make sure like, okay, they're not getting this dimension of the work. So we can't give them that responsibility. We've got to cut that out of their responsibilities. And that's all very hands-on. So it's difficult to scale, but we do want to scale it uh, once, you know, we have more time to actually dig into like, how do you produce educational curricula that's, you know, not observed by any teacher. Cool, thank you, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing I will say is that uh, some of the uh, techniques that we took ideas from was the 2009, which is outdated wildly now, uh, 2009 CIA trader prime craft, primer trade craft. Yeah, trade craft primer, that's it. <laughs> if you look up that, you know, uh, intelligence agents in the United States have to be very like unbiased, as unbiased as you could, you know, Im imagine. They're, the consequences of their intelligent work matters greatly. And so that's where we got a lot of our initial ideas about devil's advocacy research and stuff like that. We just went to, to see what was publicly available about intelligence agents and what are their methods and tools and tricks. And then we started implementing it. And then again, like it all depends on what your research outcome is. Um, we develop the tools and methods because we're trying to get a different outcome. The sciences don't share all the same methods and tools to make their observation. Depending upon what you're trying to observe, the conclusion you're trying to come to, you have to use an electron microscope or a blood test. There's all these different tests and measures and tools and things. So depending upon what you're doing, there are bespoke things for you. And my laptop's about to die, so let me grab my charger. <laughs> no worries. In the meantime, uh, anybody else has questions for uh, Jamie and this uh, wonderfully uh, in-depth presentation that she gave about the process, which is super nice. Uh, so think about your questions. And we are seven minutes past the hour or six minutes past the hour. 
And uh, we're already late, but the topic is interesting. So if nobody, if, if people are still here, we're, we'll continue to answer people's questions. So anybody has any questions for Jamie? Um, I would ask a question. So per se, if I want to, uh, so now it's very limited, right? On the information it has. It's just basically mm -hmm. somebody puts. So do I have an access as me personally, go there and just start kind of framing it? Like uh, asking per se solution and then go towards the question or I don't have an access myself. You, so that map that I showed you and that paper that I showed you, you have access to that on societylibrary.org right now. You just go to the nuclear energy section, go to the state level issue. There's the Diablo Canyon stuff. We have not published climate change, COVID, um, election integrity stuff because it's just so wildly incomplete. We are like, we only got to like the main topic flyover stage and like some like mass gathering of claims. Too much work to get done. Collections are expensive. Now that we've like completed and published our first collection, now we're focused on, okay, how much of this can we automate? And how do we get like the price per claim input down so that like it's much more feasible to tackle societal scale issues? Um, yeah, so there's a, very much a fledgling organization uh, trying to do something that people have not succeeded at for 30 years in the specific domain. Obviously there's wild success, wildly successful knowledge management companies um, and things like that, but long way to go. It was so needed. Like I, I, I can see this. Yeah, it's it's amazing. I love it. Yay! Thank you. <laughs> and uh, Jamie is too polite to say this, but uh, I will say it. Uh, everybody can donate to the Society Library to fund their efforts, and so that's also one of the ways to support it. And uh, I think um, the world will become a better place if we would. Uh, so I think we should uh, attempt to do that. And um, if there's no more questions, let's wrap this up. Uh, thank you so much, Jamie, for your time, for your energy, for your explanation, and uh, so much detail that you went through. We will uh, have uh, uh, more events coming soon. And so you can follow on now and uh, join the Discord and all those things that uh, you're already probably aware of. And thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Thank Thanks you. for having me. It's a pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Jamie. Yeah, of course. Cheers. Oh, oh, oh.